I want to welcome back Amy Sims. Hey, Amy. Hello. <laughs> Hello. Now I've been a nurse now for over 13 years. How important is educating patients on different it, it makes It makes the biggest difference. So the presentation is just breast cancer awareness. Every month when you do your, your monthly checks, you're kind of looking for some of these signs and symptoms. You're looking for lumps in your breast. You're looking for any discoloration. Um, you're looking for um, any pain. Um, your skin is irritated. Well, monthly, you breast know, exam. self check, breast exam. Okay. If okay. you don't mind. Yeah, no problem. Okay, so we want to do our monthly breast exams. We want to do it once a month. I want to introduce you all and welcome to our couch, breast cancer survivor, Miss Athena. I call it the Ann Harrington. Okay. <laughs> Thank you for joining <laughs> us tonight. You recently was diagnosed with breast cancer and you've gone through the treatments and, and you've gotten a clean bill of health. But can you kind of walk us through? For sure that I actually skipped. Uh, my mammogram, I was getting ready to go to Jamaica. So I got the call while I was at home, getting ready to go to work like at eight something in the morning. Because our, our hair is tied so close to our identity. Mm -hmm. Once my head got shaved, that was so much release of stress. And one thing I can say is enjoy life. I mean, <laughs> enjoy life, you know. I want Man. to thank both of you ladies for taking the time to come mm -hmm. and talk with me and share your story and educate us. Really? Like you should say, I know. <laughs> It is great, ain't it? Yes. <laughs>Fundraising for breast cancer is vital. It helps researchers uh, help. I just messed all of that up because that's what today is doing to us. <laughs> okay. I have the pleasure of being joined today by Lisa Moore, one of the fund who is on the fundraising committee uh, with, with the Susan G. Coleman Foundation because fundraising for breast cancer is very, very, very important. It helps conduct research. It helps patients. It helps families. It provides, um, it provides resources and all things such as that. And so today, Lisa is going to talk with us about her journey as well as some of the some of the benefits and the reason why fundraising and how to fundraise and some ways that we can, that you can help in raising funds for breast cancer. Lisa, thank you so much for joining me on today. <laughs> we have had a, we've had a day today. We have, we had a day, but that's okay. We're gonna, we're gonna shake it off. And we are, we are here for a purpose and we're going to do the thing that we are purposed to do. Mm -hmm. And we're going to let God just flow. Amen. So can you tell us a little bit? I know I don't want to tell everybody your story, but I know that you are a four time breast cancer survivor and um, you have been working with the Susan G. Coleman Foundation. But before we get into your work with the Susan G. Coleman Foundation, can you tell us just a little bit about you yourself? The journey itself? The, well, I um, am proud to say I'm a 31-year survivor of breast cancer. Um, I was originally diagnosed at 27 years old. Wow. Um, at the time, I had a 7-year-old and a 4-year-old. Wow. Let me take that back. I had a 7-year-old and I had a 3-year-old. I had... I was on top of my checkup mm -hmm. at an early age, and he felt the lump. I never felt the lump outside of it. I really wasn't checking my breast. Uh, he said it was a lump, and he sent me to have a mammogram. So I had a mammogram in January of 92, and it came back fine. But the intervention of God, I went back to him two months later in March of 92, and he said, Lisa, I know you had your mammogram in January, but I'm feeling really uneasy, still uneasy about this lump. I'm going to send you to a general surgeon, and I'm sure it's just fibro cystic tissue, whatever. I'm sure it's benign, and you'll probably just want to remove it, and you know, you're good to go. So 
So I go to the general surgeon, um, he schedules the surgery, outpatient, and even he said, oh, Lisa, I don't think you have anything to worry about. And when the pathologist report came back, it was cancer. Really? It was cancer. So I attribute that at such an early age to that I had a thorough doctor and that most importantly that God was in the midst of that that allowed me to go in because I went back to my doctor for consultation because I was going to get fixed. So, you know, I was done. I had a girl and a boy. And so that's, why, that's the reason why I yeah, went back. Right. I went back to him in March just for consultation. And he was just so thorough and like examining me and just be still this feeling of uneasiness. We could just to, to you know make me feel reassured that everything is okay. I don't know what's in to do a second opinion. So that was my journey. Um, I had um, at the time found out I had cancer, went to the medical university in Charleston for a second opinion. Um, they told me, you know, because of my age, it was a slow going cancer, um, just basically do a lumpectomy. The surgeon that originally did found the cancer, he wanted to do him a second at the time, and then the doctors down at the Medical University in Charleston, Lisa, you're so young, let's just go ahead and do a lumpectomy, give you six weeks of radiation, and we'll give you a light chemotherapy because of your age. What is a lumpectomy? A lumpectomy where they just go in and remove all kind of the tissue around the actual, around the breast area. They did it around oh, the okay. They just went and removed a lot of uh, Area around the uh, nipple area, mm -hmm. they did the, and then they removed lymph nodes out. And I think I had none of the lymph nodes were negative. I mean, were positive. So that's just basically I had that procedure. I uh, had radiation, six weeks of radiation, a light chemotherapy, it thinned my hair. So that was in '92. I was in South Carolina. So I relocated here to Texas in '98. My doctor there found me a surgeon. He I found me an oncologist here from one of her colleagues in Dallas. I came here the first visit with the oncologist. She says, okay, Lisa, we're gonna send you in. We're gonna have your chest x-ray. And I think I did, um, I think I did a chest x-ray and I think I did a mammogram. They did a chest x-ray and the receptionist, and she wasn't supposed to do this, she called me the next day Oh, Miss Moore, I'm sorry to call you, but they found a mass on your lung. Wow. Yeah, so I freaked out. Um, I was at work. I ended up going to the hospital. I'll never forget that. I ended up going because I, I was so hysterical that it's a mass on my lung. I mean, I was almost at, yeah, I was, yeah, I was, yeah, but that was a 99. I was on the seven-year mark. So I ended up, my oncologist found out about it. She came up to the hospital. Um, they end up doing a CAT scan, it is still there, and then I end up having a biopsy, and the breast cancer had metastasized and moved over to the upper left lobe of my lung. Left wow. Lung. Yes. The, so they, the cancer, but yeah. when they took the, when they took the, the where, where they supposedly took out right. all of the... Right. But again, it could be so microscopic, get in your bloodstream and then travel. So, really? for years, so I was almost at the point of being seven years, you know, basically when you get to that mark, hey, I'm, you know, I'm a hundred percent. So I was almost at that point and that's when it happened. It, it you know, it, it reoccurred on the upper left lobe of my lung. I ended up having a fourth of my left lung removed. And at that point, I had to, my doctor determined you know, well, if it metastasized that move, it may be somewhere else in your body. And I'm telling you, at that point, this is seven years later than my original diagnosis, my first initial diagnosis. So at that time, so seven years later, my son was 14. Yeah, my son was, so at that point, so he was seven, three, this was seven, yeah, he was 14 and my daughter was 11. And they told me, I'll never forget the doctor, well, we're going to so they determined it was cancer, but we're also going to have to do a PET scan. A PET scan is your entire bottom, mm. bottom from top to bottom, just to see if the cancer is somewhere else. And I'm telling you, that was the scariest point in my life because if it was in another part of my body, then it would probably be, I, I just imagined that I'm not going to make it. Mm -hmm. It's going to grow like crazy. Mm -hmm. And I just remember going in that day, and it was just, I had just joined church and gotten back in the church. 
Really? I, yeah, I had just gotten back in the church when I moved here. I moved here in 98. A friend from work had invited me to a church. And I mean, I knew about God and faith and everything. I mean, my first go round with it, you know, it was a big C back in 92. Every time you mentioned cancer. Yeah. Yeah. They looked at it as a death form. Yeah. So, you know, I think more so in that time in 99, when they getting ready to scan my whole body to see if the cancer was anywhere else, it's just like. I think everything just came to a standstill and here I've got these young kids that I may possibly leave behind. Yeah. Yeah. So they did a scan. I'll never forget the radiologist at a local hospital there in Fort Worth. They did the uh, PET scan or they did a CAT scan and he came back and he told me that day, they didn't let me wait over the weekend. I'll never forget. I did it on a Friday. He said, Miss Moore, I'm not going to let you go into the weekend not knowing mm. whether or not he said, I'm, I'm happy to tell you your cancer is contained just in that upper lo lobe of your left lung. Okay. So I'll, I'll never forget that day. I went home, jumped on the trampoline with the kids. It just gave me just a new outlook on life that God was going to let me, you know, he was going to get me through that period. So that was, I think, just the scariest time of doing that in 99. So I went through all that. I mean, I had taken my, fa my faith to a different level with my kids, and God gave me another chance, you know, to really – beat the cancer and I went 13 years. I went 13 years and it came back in 2012. So when I walked in, I just think when I walked into my oncologist, I went in from a mammogram at Women's Solar Center, went in and they said, this area over on your right breast is suspicious, biopsy, it was cancer. So I walked in my oncologist when she called, when I saw her number, I knew that it was, I walked in, she already told me, Lisa, we're gonna go ahead and take those boobies off. So. <laughs> And I was, you know, it at that point, I just went through the, you know, went through all the, what I had to do, had them taken off, reconstruction, in surgery for 10 hours and oh my God. for five days. But, you know, God got me through that. It was a rough time. And he allowed me, you know, to again, be here for my kids. Mm -hmm. My daughter had got married like the year before and, you know, it's just when I went through it that third time and, you know, I did all that, I was just like, you know, God, you have a plan for me. And, you know, all of this of the journey was not for me, but it was for someone else. And I never and I tell everybody I'm just going through that journey. That was the third time. The fourth time it came back was in 2020, right at COVID. So I'm like, how would it come back near the original site? I've had, you know, I had the breast taken off, but it was just, you know, it's microscopic. It was near the wall area. My surgeon just went in and just did like a partial um, mastectomy, took it out. They changed my medication, my doctor. And, you know, that was, I think, out of all the, the you know, the trials and tribulations of dealing with breast cancer at that point, I went into a depression for a little bit. I felt like I had no one. I really? No in, in 2020? When yeah, you... 2020, yeah. Uh -huh. when my last diagnosis, which, you, you know, I've always had a slow going cancer, but I just felt like, I don't know what with COVID going on and all, and then getting cancer again, that I had no one, I had nobody. And I think I kind of shut myself off from everyone. And I've always told people, you know, with friends when they were depressed or whatever family, you're too blessed to be depressed. Mm -hmm. And I had never in all my years. And at the time when that happened, that was I was 55 years old with that last. Yeah, that last. Yeah. Back Girl, back. you do not look 50. Yeah. Well, you, you're not 55 I, now. I'm How? 58 and a half. About wow, years. you look good. But, you know, that's God. But, you know. Just going through that, you just never know what people are going through. And, and, and I think I came to the realization of understanding how people go through depression and feeling like, you know, there's no hope or whatever. It wasn't that I got a bad diagnosis or anything. I didn't have to have chemotherapy. I only had chemotherapy back in 99. But I just felt like I had no one and nobody. And it was just like me by myself in the world. I was separated from the world. And I just feel that the enemy wanted to do that for me mm. out of everything, all the goodness and the mercy that God has shown me over all these years to spare my life, to allow me to watch my kids go through grade school, to go through high school, to get married, to have grandkids, to witness all of that. I, get, I had to get out of that funk of where I felt that because I lived by myself. I went through a divorce and... You know, I had to get out of that and, you know, just pray to God to get me out of the life that I have because I have such a great support system. Wow. And that has really helped me through all the trials and tribulation, family, friends, 
church members, support groups. I mean, it has, you know, I've just had it here and I've just think through everything that I've gone through is to never sweat the small things that has taught me just to appreciate every moment that life gives you mm -hmm. and not to take it for granted mm -hmm. and to inspire you know and encourage other women mm -hmm. that god left me here for a purpose and i think it really helps me you know stay healthy and keep going you know? is that is that how you think you got out of the depression like what did what type of things did you do to move yourself from that depressive state into back into your normal of, of, of um actually connecting with other people of course it's praying and what but to connect with other people mm -hmm. and not to shut them in because you need people to pour in you we yeah. all like sometimes think that we're strong and we don't need to raise our hand or mm -hmm. we take let pride set in and i'm strong i can handle this but we all need somebody you need to reach out for yeah. yeah and you need to be able to recognize and people need to be able to recognize if you're going through something and you say oh i'm okay mm. and they say oh just let me know if you need anything you should be able to read that somebody needs you right then you shouldn't have to wait until them to come you know to reach out because i wasn't okay at that point and then i was shutting people out of my life that really loved me a lot and really cared so really i just got out of that funk and just got back into the happy go lucky lisa optimistic lisa that loves life the life of the party and all i just got back and you know just kind of switched gears but because I, you know it's not always easy especially strong people it's not always easy for us to voice the words i need help or i'm not okay and so when you say when, when you when you just said that about how when people say i'm okay you got to be able to see it and go further and recognize that right no they're not okay mm -hmm. and 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 that's that's really where your relationship with god comes in mm -hmm. and that discernment comes in so that god can god can help you to identify what it god what is it that i can do that they can't say they can't say the words mm -hmm. how can i help them that is so important is that how you is that how you got into fundraising we're gonna we're gonna kind of switch over is that how you got into fundraising and the work that you do with susan g coleman definitely just to make a difference because there's so many women out there that um need mammograms they don't know and especially in the african-american community mm -hmm. that women out there that are not getting checked and i don't have insurance but it's just so many resources and programs out there and i saw what susan g coleman had to offer to women out there mm -hmm. of all ethnicities of what they could do what they could offer for them so i just wanted to get involved just to help just to point them to resources to resources that were available and to educate them on you know programs that are out there and support groups to let them know that they're not alone we're all in this fight together yeah. so i think with susan g coleman it just united me with other sisters that are going through that have gone through or going through mm -hmm. or will go through mm -hmm. but majority is ones that have gone through and are currently going through and just to make a difference and to encourage them and to educate them and pass on information that's what my assignment is oh i love that Let, let's 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 not make the assumption that everybody knows uh about the susan g coleman foundation why don't you tell why don't you tell our audience a little bit about the susan g coleman foundation what it does and how it is that you you know what it is exactly that you do with the foundation and how even how they can connect and and work and help and well the first thing i could tell to the listening audience is if you have any questions they have a support line it's 1-800-GO-COLEMAN so if you've nothing else that you can remember, they have an email, but I tell people 1-800-GO-COLEMAN. Their operating hours is from 9 a.m. to 10 p.m. Monday through Friday. If you've got any issues, you just need to talk to anyone. Mm -hmm. If you're going through, if you've been recently diagnosed or currently going through and you've got issues, you need to talk to someone to get some answers, have some questions, you can reach out to them during those operating hours. Uh, there's resources available, women that are going through breast cancer mm -hmm. or, you know there's resources out there to help you with your rent and it's all dependent on as you know where your financial status of what your need mm -hmm. and there's programs out there to help you with your rent to help you with your medication help you with child care mm -hmm. i mean that stuff like that along as far as resources uh to find you outfits for insurance programs out there there's so many programs that they offer and monies that susan g coleman gives to other outfits that put um mammogram trucks out there to give you know to do mammographies and all there's 
a lot of resources that are doing the community and just doing the research, mm -hmm. the research that we can put an end to this deadly disease yes. so that we have less women having to deal with this. And, you know, it's all about being proactive than reactive. So um, I've just been part of Susan G. Coleman. I think if I've been dealing with this for 31 <laughs> years when I moved here, started doing the walks and I started getting involved with registration, giving out t-shirts, registering folks, uh, setting up for the walks. Um, then I started getting more, doing the walks and getting my team together and being in the top team, the top five and 10. I mean, I started out with the top 10 teams and top 10 fundraisers and it got to number five, went down to number wow. two a couple times this past year, number two uh, fundraiser uh, in Fort Worth and then uh, Three years ago, I was number one, but I do it all because I want to give back to make a difference yes. and use those funds again for research, you know, Let financial me, status. So, because we, we, our audience consists of a lot of different women in different walks of life doing different things, and, and I thank you for sharing your story. I just kind of want to talk business just a little bit. So you, because I know that you sit, I, I, I think I read something that you sit on the council, on one of the councils. Uh, with Susan G. Coleman and you as you just said you've done a lot of fundraising work and different things like that what are some some what's some advice that you would give to some of our business owners or some of our women who are looking to raise funds for their organizations their nonprofits we've had different nonprofits um, on the show we connect with a lot of nonprofits and for-profit businesses and different things like that and they're always looking for ways to raise funds so what are some what are some of the top tips that you would give them as far as how to fundraise that you found to be very effective you're doing it on an individual status how it worked for me and i'm going to tell you that i still do this i set up snack I, i've actually purchased cake products throughout the year from different sites like oriental training um breastcancer.com a lot of different organizations and actually just have sales within like in my building just selling pink supplies mm. pink items you know from pants to t-shirts um scarves and hats and um just an arraignment of things that i've done over the years but i mean in bake sales i mean i'm just telling you it's just all collectively of just and just reaching out to family and friends that's really how i have done it mm -hmm. and then from you know my employers i've got sponsorship where yeah. they have actually donated money but it's just actually it's just so many ways you can network it but that's work for me mm -hmm. as to how i have been successful in raising money but I think more so in the last couple of years, it's just connecting with people that I know by, you know, just sending out an email, a nice email, just kind of outlining why I'm raising it, you know. A closed mouth, story. don't get fed. Basically, <laughs> they, they kind of ripped up the channels of the way you can reach out to people on Facebook and mm -hmm. Instagram, but Facebook, I mean, it's just a lot of little channels to reach out to people and, I even this year made it even more inviting and I think it'll even go to a different level. But everybody that donates will be in the pot for a couple monetary prizes at the end cash prizes that I awarded to out of all the people that donated gave cash prizes. So just, that just kinda gave them an incentive to maybe to donate. You know? Really? Yeah. And and how do you stay how do you stay motivated? How do you stay in good space all the time how do you keep yourself consistently positive throughout God all of this? this and people look at me and you just never know who's watching you because i am a positive people i love life i love life i love people mm -hmm. and i just think this is just and i have a lot of energy i just love people and i stay busy and it just keeps my mind mm -hmm. I'm just it just it just keeps my mind in a good state just staying busy and then I'm involved in so much and I complain to Dr. I'm tired, tired, but at the end of the day, I love what I do and it keeps yeah. me motivated. It keeps me feeling good. I feel the best that I've ever felt and people, it just blows their mind. Their minds when I tell them that I'm a four-time survivor and just kind of explain the surgeries and chemotherapy and everything and biopsies that I've gone through over time, they never believe it. They never believe it, but my pastors always say, you're not supposed to look like, like what you're going through. through. Yeah. yeah. So again, it's just, I love life and I just think the spirit that God has put within me is to make a difference. It's, it's, I'm here for a purpose. I have a purpose here and I know that now and I don't take it lightly. 
So if you were to describe your purpose, because I 100% believe you and I, there is nothing more fulfilling. And it's that internal joy when you are living your purpose and doing your purpose. It's, it's the reason why you can smile all the time when people say, Boy, yeah, that's because I'm living my purpose. What would you, how would you describe your purpose? Here. My purpose here, and I know my purpose, is to make a difference in the lives of others. And when I get a young lady that she inboxed the other day, Lisa, and I, she said, Lisa, I saw, you know, when you connected with my mom, she lost her mom, the breast cancer, and just how you were. And I see you on Facebook and just how you inspired everything. And now I'm going through it. And you just really touched my life. And I never know this the young lady was kind of watching or keeping up mm -hmm. with me, but just to make the difference in her life and that she wants to reach out to me and just to give her hope and inspiration. That's that means so much to me. That means so much to me. And a young lady I went to a, a gathering with a few other survivors that I've known for years and years at dinner, met this young lady for the first time. She inboxed me and we said, you really blessed me because I had went through some stuff and you sitting there telling your story mm -hmm. that just really did something to the inside of me. And just stuff like that when people tell me that, you know, I inspired them to run on yeah. and not give up. Yeah. You know, even in, in, in not necessarily cancer or other situations yeah. that they had in life. Because if Lisa can walk around, she's got all that baggage, all this stuff that she's gone through, I can do it. Yeah. I can run this race too. Yeah. I won't quit. I agree. I, I do. I agree so much. This is one of the reasons why I love what I do here at Next Level. I love sharing stories of women like yourself who have had these experiences. And then you come and you share them with others and the things that you've been through and, and, and your positive attitude just to remind us, you know what, I can do it. Because it's a, you're pinpointing, and this is something God told me just the other day, pinpointing and you're telling me when you tell me your story you're letting me see what god can do i'm looking at what god can do i'm hearing what god can do and then we share that with people who are who are in the middle of something and and our stories remind them god can do it he can bring you out of anything there is no situation that's too complicated and you're a beautiful living testimony and I just, I thank you so much. I do. I thank you so much for coming all the way from Fort Worth. <laughs> I know it wasn't. I just, I just, I appreciate you. And I appreciate the work that you're doing. I appreciate your love for people. How do you, when you, when you meet these young women and you're constantly interacting with women with breast cancer or that are going through and different things like that. And, and I, I, I asked this question even from a person who I interact with a lot of people. Mm -hmm. And so we get a lot of people's stories and we we get a lot of the things that they're going through, people who are in the middle of trials and tribulations mm -hmm. right now. And you have to be intentional about not taking it on. How do you maintain your positive mindset, your your joy when you're constantly hearing the stories of people who are going through or who have lost their loved one or you know who who's in the middle of and having a hard time how do you not allow that to affect you and you continue to maintain lisa in the I, I know what he did for me and i know that he is still able and you know um in order to win you gotta fight and that's you know what i'm telling them to encourage them because i've just had Lately, so many, one of my dear friends was in the, she's almost at the point of retiring next year. She found out she's got cancer and she's going through breast cancer and going through vigorous um, treatment right now, for, you know, chemotherapy. But, you know, she has such a positive attitude and she's really inspired me. But it's just, I just have to remember what God did for me and he can do for me. And I don't let that just kind of take you, know, you down. Right. Just, it just, just maintaining positive for them because at the, it's not about me when I'm dealing with them. It's yes. about them. It's yes. not about me. It's about them. So it's just to keep them uplifted and I'll text them and send them scriptures and just positive sayings and maybe send them a cancer item, a shirt or You've got to become something. my best friend. Yeah, but I mean, it's just to, it makes me feel so good. Mm -hmm. You just don't know what it does to 
for and to give mm-hmm. to someone because God never lets me lack. And it's not about material things. When you go through this fight with cancer, it's not about material mm-hmm. things. It puts it in perspective that you're just alive, that I can get up, I can dress myself, I can walk and talk, you know, and I can do, I can roller skate, I can do any of this stuff. I'm not limited to what I can do after gone through four surgeries. Mm-hmm. I mean, I'm not, I can do anything that the average person, well, now I'm almost 59, so some stuff, you know, maybe. <laughs> You know, but, you know, I am, you know, I'm just energized. I'm just my family. They know what I just love life. And I think it just took it to a different level with all I went through and yes. God allowed all this and for me to be an inspiration to others. And I'm just going to keep running this race, you know, until, you know, until he tells you, yeah, you, you yeah, until you've done, holds, you've done you know, all that you can. About tomorrow, but I know who holds tomorrow. So yes. I don't know the future holds, but again, I'm going to keep running this race. As long as I've got, you know, breath in my body and I'm always maintain hope. I love it. Giving up is never an option. It's never an option. Never an option. And you gotta keep running. Yeah. Keep moving. Yeah, and no keep matter what. My story and I tell all these people that I'm meeting, tell your story, tell your story. Mm-hmm. I don't care what you've gone through, cancer, mm-hmm. anything, tell your story because you know, when you go through the stuff, it's not for you again, like mm-hmm. I've said many times, it's for other people. Yes. It's not for you. So always tell your story. Yes. And I thank you so much. I do. I thank you so much for coming on sharing your story with us. We have have another wonderful guest that we are going to get ready to bring on to join me and Lisa on the couch right after this. I'm Robbie Lynn. My name is Tatiana. I'm Josh. I'm Saracia. Hi, my name is Zoe. I'm Sterling. And I'm Eden. My name is Deja. Hey, I'm Nicole. And my name is Ashley. Hi, I'm Patrice and this is Bryce. And we're joining Next Level in the fight against breast cancer. And I'm joining Next Level in the fight against breast cancer. And we're joining Next Level in the fight against breast cancer. And I'm joining Next Level in the fight against breast cancer. And we're joining Next Level in the fight against breast cancer. And we're we're joining joining Next Next Level in the the fight against breast cancer. here your host of next level conversations and i want to thank all of you for joining us all month long as we've been bringing the stories of courageous women in their fight against breast cancer next week we're doing something different we will be having our first ever live studio audience it's gonna be fun as we get ready to bring a conclusion to our series with national breast cancer foundation representative i'm excited about this next level that god had us on and i am excited to bring you along with us With over 25 years experience as a corporate trainer and a certified Jack Camfield trainer in the success principles, Lauren supports others in their professional and personal growth. Her company, Easy Success Strategies LLC, focuses on providing others with the tools to live a truly peaceful, fulfilling, and defining life on their own terms. Please welcome back Lauren Fisher to the couch. Hey, my sweet Lauren. Hey there. Thank you for having me again. I love being here again. Thank you so much for joining us today. And thank you, as always, for saying yes. I am so excited um, to have you joining us on tonight. I'm excited to be here. But before we start, I just have to say, Lisa, oh my gosh, you are so inspiring. You are a living angel and your story is just simply amazing. And I'm just, when I heard your story, I I was just blown away because four times, four times, I mean, you're a living, walking, breathing angel on this earth and and you're here for a reason and I just have to give you a big hug. Oh, I love me some Lord. So thank you for being here. You make me want to cry because you're just so inspiring and uh, you're just amazing. And both of you look so pretty in your pink And, and, and Lauren, the last time you were here and and if you have not if you did not catch the last episode the last time the last show when lauren was here please go to our youtube and watch her uh her episode let go and allow and before we before we get into our talk 
I do want to know, since the last time you were here, what have you been up to? Gosh, well, I'm building my personal brand, um, putting together experiential workshops, uh -huh. because I believe in when you bring people together in a workshop setting and you do actual um, deep dives together, um, there's a different kind of magic that happens and you connect with other people mm -hmm. that are on the same path mm -hmm. and it helps you grow and you're being supported and you're supporting other people mm -hmm. and you're giving each other permission to grow. Yeah. So that's what I've been up to. And of course, um, I'm, uh, I'm an advisor on the Girl Cave tribe yes. i mean there's so there's um the business edition and the girl cave tribe it's an amazing group so check them out on facebook and i've been attending all these different events and, and meeting just great people everywhere I'm, I'm like lisa i love meeting people and i i just i'm so inspired by them and uh, i love to learn so I'm just i agree and, that, and that's how me and you met at at a workshop or a conference doing in exactly, california yeah, in california <laughs> doing exactly what you exactly what you're talking about so we're 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 we're, we're going to be talking about today and today is actually a very special day it is why don't you tell us which i just found out about today and i swear i i, I think you're one of the most amazing people in the world why don't you tell you're us amazing. what today is so um today would have been my mother's 77th birthday mm -hmm. And she um, passed away from breast cancer on Christmas in 2011. It, she, it's okay because, you know, my mom had a strong faith and mm -hmm. she finally got what she wanted. I mean, who gets to go home on Christmas and mm -hmm. celebrate with Jesus, you know, mm -hmm. and that's what she wanted. So I just focus on that, that she was able to have her way and get her gift on Christmas. So mm -hmm. that's what I choose to focus on. Um, she had breast cancer for 17 years. And because of not only your journey, but all the fundraising you and all these other wonderful people do, there's been so much advancement in early detection, mm -hmm. in treatments. Mm -hmm. um, I also work for LabCorp, which is a clinical laboratory where we improve health and improve lives. And, you know, we are there to assist with preclinical, analytical, post-analytical, um, support for our patients and helping doctors determine a patient's healthcare status. So, what I, I feel like we are all in this together. Mm -hmm. Whether you've had breast cancer or not, chances are you're touched by somebody. Yes. I've had coworkers, my sister-in-law, um, people I've known through the Jack Canfield community. One of my mentors and, and closest and dearest friends, Teresa Huggins. She had breast cancer and she passed away last year, and that, that was pretty hard. But um, the Susan G. Komen Foundation um, it, and these other foundations, if you have the opportunity to contribute in some way, even in the smallest, there's no contribution that's too small. Mm, you're absolutely right. You, I mean, and it's, and I, and I say this to people all the time, you never know when it's going to touch you. And so my mom, my mom, one of the things my mom taught us is always be willing to give because you never know when you're going to when you're going to need or when you're going to be in that position, when you're going to get that phone yes. call. And we've talked we've been we've been talking with quite a few different women who have been sharing their stories and their journeys um, with breast cancer. But we're actually I, I actually want to talk to you from from the point of view of a daughter, or so, a, a, you know, someone you were you were not on the outside looking in but it wasn't you who actually had the cancer but you watched your mother and right. uh, go through this and you had to deal with it hands on and so i kind of want to i, I want to hear about your journey if you don't mind sure. some of the things that that you experienced some of the 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 uh, you, you call your because i agree I, and i've heard a lot of your story but you call your mom a miracle because god worked so many miracles in her life and, and i know oh we don't gosh, have the yeah. time for you to go into depth on all of it but he worked so many he, you saw god work so many miracles in your mom's life and so i just want to hear it from your eyes from your point of view how how that experience how that journey was for you so in the beginning when she was first diagnosed i was in my 20s and it was frightening, scary. You hear the C word, 
-hmm. And you don't know how to take it, you know? And my mom was much like you, very strong, very tenacious. She, you know, was under the weather with chemo. She had a single mastectomy. And, and so let me just back up. Her cancer was missed at first. She was misdiagnosed. And then once they finally diagnosed, kind of like you, the doctor wasn't comfortable and he said, you know, let's dig a little deeper. And they did a biopsy. He came out negative, but he went deeper because he felt uh, something's not right. Sure enough, it was positive. Mastectomy. I think it was a year, year and a half later or so, um, her lymph nodes in her neck were swollen and she went back to a few of our different doctors, and they said, um, it, it's from your hair coloring and perms. And she wasn't happy with that. And come to find out, um, she, ha she had some skin issues, eczema and folliculitis and all these things. And she was at the dermatologist and had this red spot on her back. And she goes, you know what? This just doesn't seem right to me. He goes, that's cellulitis. She goes, I want a second opinion. You're sending me somewhere else. Because back then, you had to have a referral. So she went about three hours away to a specialist, to another dermatologist. They biopsied that piece of her skin, and it was breast cancer that wow. spread to her skin and lymphatics. So her metastases, it, it, you know, some people have a tumor in their lung or in another part of their body. It was throughout her whole lymphatic system. She was very lucky and blessed because right at the time of her diagnosis, so they go back and they retest the blocks from the tissue they removed because now this new gene was um, discovered called HER2 new. It was HER2 new gene. They retested the block for that genetic marker because at the time it, it didn't exist with her first diagnosis. They weren't aware of it. She had it, but not only that, this medication called Herceptin, it was actually a monoclonal antibody just just came out on the market had that monoclonal antibody not difficult word to say <laughs> had not been on the market she she wouldn't have been around very long because really? the outlook was not good so she actually um it you know she she went on for another you know 14 15 years and like you her oncologist dr sheila lemke was amazing and i don't know if you experienced this in your journey but you know there's certain ailments or diseases that kind of take a certain track like they anticipate certain things that are normal course for that disease she would have different things come up health wise and when she would question different physicians they would discount and say oh no no it's it's nothing and she said no 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 no, I want to be tested, and I don't care if I have to pay for this test. And sure enough, she'd get tested. She would be positive for whatever she thought it was. And so then she would get treatment. And when she moved to Florida, her health care was much different. They weren't as aggressive, and she had to be more aggressive and advocate more for herself. As she took care of my stepfather, who had Parkinson's, who was in a pretty severe state of it, so um, she had a long journey, and then um, they took her off her septum because they thought it was causing other issues. And now her cancer was kind of going out of control, and the other treatments would work temporarily, and then it would start to come back. And because she wasn't being heard, hmm. by the time they, um, they finally did a brain MRI, and she had brain tumor. And within 12 weeks, she was paralyzed on her whole entire left side. Mm -hmm. And we had to take care of her. That was hard. When you, um, when you see the strongest person you know in the world, who was also a caretaker for everybody else. You know, and it was funny because we could, we, we, we were very, humorous family so years prior i would say to her well you know um uh, uh, don't expect me to take care of you because i'll just find you the best nurse to go but i'm not i'm not taking care of you <laughs> you know but when it comes down to it it's it's very different and you're going to do anything you can yes, you know you yes. you've had yours and you know yes. you know and um 
I have two brothers and we just, we, we took care of her and we moved her up here. Uh, my, my stepfather had passed away pri right immediately prior to this, like God's divine intervention, the way it all unfolded. Because how would we have taken care of him and her, you know? I, I mean, the way it unfolded and um, she, w she was with us about a year and a half. Once, once I heard it was in her brain, I just knew, uh, you know, it's just a matter of time. And so now I just tried to focus on God gave me the gift of time. Mm. God gave me the gift of time. How lucky am I yeah. to have this gift of time because um, so many people, sudden heart attack, yeah. car accident, so many sudden things, right? And I was given the gift of time. And how many children lose their mom at a young age or never know their mom? And, and I had her until my, my 40s, you know? So I was so blessed. And it was hard. But that's what I would try and focus on. And um, I, I just felt so blessed that God gave me that gift. Wow. And that, you know, I, I think it's so amazing. And it, it, speaks to, it speaks to who you are, that you can see the beauty and the, and the gifts, even in, even in something, something so tragic and going through so bad. And you've always been that way. Well, you know, again, God puts people in your life and in your path for a reason. And, I, you know, had I not, first of all, my mom's strength and tenacity, right? Mm -hmm. I had to be strong for her. And she taught me to be that way. And, and I wasn't hiding my feelings, but I knew you know, I had to step up and take care of things. But through the personal development training, I met so many wonderful people that I could rely on. Yes. And I had my brothers and I had my close and dear friends back home who helped me when I brought my mom to Florida. And I mean, the woman's paralyzed on one side. So we're trying to get her on a plane, get her in and out of bathrooms, bring her back to Florida so she could enjoy Florida one last time. One of my best friends came with me. She happened to be laid off from work at the time. I mean, what a blessing. And I said, hey, would you like to come with us to Florida and help me with my mom? I mean, the way it just is tragic as it is and was when I look back, I mean, I had so many blessings and so many angels around me. And I still do to this day. And you're one of them. <laughs> and you're one of them. I mean, you know, um, when you look for the gratitude in life and it's where you put your awareness, we get to choose yes. where we focus our attention. God gives us that choice. And when I, when I focus on that, it's not always easy. I, you know, <laughs> because sometimes she's on the other end of the phone and I'm on the other end of the phone for you and, and you're on the other end of the phone for other people. But this is what we do. You know, it. we don't judge and we support. And how, how can I just be there for you? I love it. I love it. We're going to we're, we're going to take a short we're going to take a short break sure. um, and then we're going to come back. And, and I want to ask you ladies a few questions because we've run out of time. This has went by so fast. And so I didn't get a chance to let my audience uh, answer any questions. But I want to talk a little bit more. Next level had the privilege of participating in the more than pink walk. Um, here in a few weeks ago and Lauren joined us and so we are going to just show real quick this little video of our time at the Morden Peak. We doing next level. Where are we going? Next level. Where are we going? Next level. Hey! So I want to ask, and, and Lauren, we're, we're, I want to close it with you because we just didn't get a chance to uh, do all the things that I wanted to do. But Lisa, one of my one of the audience members did ask, how do you and, and, and this is actually for both of you. But Lauren, I want to end with you. How do you find time to self-care while you take care of your loved ones? 
how, how do you how do you do it now? And Lauren, how did you do it when you were taking care of your mom? Well, you find time, and I think more so in the last time ten years, I've found time to do Lisa take care self care for Lisa. Because how can I pour to other people and tell them your health is your wealth, and I'm not taking care of Lisa being a four time survivor? So I make time to where I'm traveling more, going and getting pampered more with the facial and getting a deluxe pedicure and just doing, you know, things for Lisa and, you know, more shopping, therapy <laughs> shopping just for Lisa. But that's self care for me that I think I kind of put that on hold for so many years. and in past years because I'm pouring into other people and involved in everything. But again, I gotta be healthy if I'm trying to get other people to mm -hmm. help them stay healthy. Mm -hmm. So Lisa, I gotta continue to stay healthy. So I gotta do things, self care for myself. And I think with uh, with traveling and, you know, doing more of these massages and facials, that is really self care for myself and have you always have you always took care of yourself like that or do you and even when you were sick you didn't take care it was of yourself all about the kids working all about the kids family whatever pouring into mm -hmm. everybody else but again at the end of the day i wouldn't have it any other way because in every area god has never let me lack and everything mm -hmm. and i think that's why you just keep oh, oh i love me. that it just put me you know on the forefront of just you know out there for other people so he doesn't let me like but again you know that inner spirit is telling you lisa you got to rest in the days that i take time and just don't i don't do anything and i just rest and that's what i need i have to, you know to slow down so i can catch up because i can't be everywhere and i can't say yes all the time so mm -hmm. i've come to the realization of that as i've gotten older but you know that's the self-care that you know i do for myself and that's where I'm able to renew myself and refresh, and then I can just go out there and fight even stronger and be an inspiration to so many. I love it. And Lauren, as you, and, and I would, because I, I know a lot of your current self care, baby, because you be on it. But as you were taking care of your mom, when your mom, how did you, how did you keep from losing yourself and, and give yourself? Because it's one of the things that I struggle with now with my mom being sick. How, do you, how did you, in that process, continue to? Look out for Lauren. I didn't. I honestly didn't. I had great family and friends. And at this point, my mom was living with my youngest brother. And the first three months, I spent every night there. And so I took myself off the road. I was traveling on the road overnight. Took my, I had a great, you know, I worked for a great company who allowed me to come off the road, figure things out. And I worked locally. Um, my son's dad, we weren't together. And we were always we always maintained a great relationship and he was so helpful um and you know i i would spend every night at my brother's house because we had to bring my mom into the bathroom she couldn't do anything for herself mm -hmm. and um i didn't i i didn't do self-care i was surviving and i was i was actually more focused on my mom's quality of life because right now it's not quantity of life, it's quality yeah. of life. And with her having even the smallest quality of life gave me quality of life. Like just, you know, when you pour into other people, it wasn't about me right now. And we had the best aids to help us during the day. We really we were blessed in so many ways. So I didn't think, I mean, it was a good day if my mom was in a good mood and she felt good. Um, because again, when you go from fully functional to suddenly paralyzed on one side and your life is completely different, it's, shat it's life shattering. And so um, my self care was, everybody else was good, I'm good, I'm good. Um, when she passed away, I didn't know what to do with myself. Mm. I, I I, now I was going home every night and I didn't know what to do, what do I do? I'm so used to, again, I identified with these other labels. so. Again, it was a slow progression into self-care, and that's when the personal development um, actually started to come in, and um, it was my family and friends. Um, I was being led when I didn't know I was being led, yeah. and I'm glad I was listening. I love that, I love that. So we have, we've run out of time, but I wanna end this because I wanna celebrate your mom's life. Tell us, if you don't mind, share real quick one of your best memories of your mom. Gosh, there's so many. It's um, 
my mom was always a lifelong learner and she always encouraged that and and i was not the easiest teen so <laughs> i got a lot of years of her yelling and uh, but um if the woman could sleep at night it was a good night for her but uh yeah she she was a lifelong learner and she instilled that in us and and such a great work ethic mm -hmm. and um you know take care of your family family first I love it. I love it. I appreciate both of you ladies for taking the time to join me here on the couch. I have probably like a minute and a half. And I want you to tell us, Lisa, just a little bit about what Survivors with Purpose is. That's your um, that's your 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 foundation. Well, it's a, it's this group that I formed um, It's part of my church and I formed it in 2014. We kind of not gotten together post COVID, so we did it from 2014 to 2019. We just got women together, just women that I knew, women that I knew that were going through. We'd have speakers come in to tell us about nutrition. Uh, we'd have a fitness coach come in, do some exercises with us, and people that had just finished treatment of exercises that they could do, you know, after having you know a mastectomy or lumpectomy or whatever. Um, we had people in there just to the psychological part of it, just would have speakers come in um, from one of the local Moncrief. I could just reach out and then we would just get together and just tell our stories, go yeah. around the room, everybody just tell their stories of their journey. And then we would have someone, like I said, with fitness or um, uh, nutritional or someone that, you know, a psychologist dealing with mental health of just where do we go now of dealing with it and the anxiety of having breast cancer and the fear of, you know, maybe it returning. So that's what we did just to empower. And that was the purpose of the Survivors with Purpose, just to get women together to, you know, just to empower them, to educate them with knowledge and to encourage them and that we all need this. But most importantly, we're not in this alone. I love that. If someone wants to connect with you, how would they do that? Well, they can connect with me. I don't have a website yet, but you can find me on Facebook. It's Lisa Allen on Facebook if you'd like to uh, connect with me. All right. And I would love to talk with you. All right. And Ms. Lauren, Easy Success Secrets, okay? Easy Success Easy, strategies. easy Success Strategies. And it's a tongue this. twister. <laughs> How would, how would somebody connect with you? So they can go to easysuccessstrategies.com. They can also find me on LinkedIn under Lauren Fisher and also Facebook Lauren Fisher. All right. Ladies, I, I again, I appreciate you. I appreciate well, you. Thank you for having for, us. Thanks. For driving so far and for coming and sharing this special day with us and giving us your mom, giving us a piece of your mom. Mm -hmm. um, I just, I appreciate it. And I love you ladies. I want to thank our audience for joining us on tonight. I want to let you know that we love you. We appreciate you. And we will see you all next week.